Welcome everybody and thank you very much uh, for staying with us to the last presentation. And I want it to be somehow a summarization of the session also and that's why the title of the presentation, do we have a heading for a hard question about mobile GIS in archaeology? And I would like to start with uh, discussing what is mobile GIS today, how we are using. And as you saw in previous presentations, uh, a lot of us are working on PDAs and mobile application uh, on PDAs. However, as uh, Nazar pointed out, the uh, Windows is not supporting anymore a mobile Windows uh, software and therefore these PDAs are fading away to give a space for everyday device that we have in our pocket like tablets or t phones when you can collect the data and upload it to the online maps and present it them in real time. Of course, the goal of this is to have the same map in all our working devices, so phones, tablet, and then further to laptops and to <coughs> computers. And also we can uh, watch in real time how people are collecting and synchronizing, synchronizing the data. Recently, uh, Data had an entry uh, on her blog, uh, it was just before the conference, and that's why I decided to add it. Uh, she discussed the geospatial ecosystem in digital environment. And let me quote her here. The expansion of geospatial market is driven by tremendous innovation in the digital technologies used to generate them or the ones it rides on. Faster processors, better displays, wireless networks, online databases, fixed and mobile sensors. So what we are witnessing is that these disparate technologies grow new branches and spawn new hybrids as inventive minds seek new solutions. And mobile GIS is one of them. How you can see on the slide, mobile GIS connect different fields of this geospatial ecosystem and probably in future will add new features also. The growth of app has been driven by the evolution of mobile devices like tablets and smartphones. And apps are platforms and softwares neutral and have to follow an open standards to be acceptable in the market. So this is an excellent op uh, opening for independent developers and it will allow professional to create professional apps which will be crafted for very specific uh, different fields and archaeology is one of them. <laughs> Data continues in her blog entry that the linkage between internet GIS and mobile GIS is essential to remember. An integrated special decision support system relies on four major components, wireless network, online GIS, mobile devices, and their OS. Further, location-based services, which is the base for mobile GIS software, depend on the cutting edge technologies, which is wireless location. And this is how our devices has GPS position positioning in it, and also the mobile internet. To finish the quotation from data, she writes, recent developments in the processing capabilities of smartphones and other mobile computing devices have contributed to making location-based services much more accessible to many users. And again, archaeologists are one of them, and we are using this. So, my presentation, uh, after reading this, uh, this blog entry and after experiment that I want to uh, present you in a, sec uh, in a second, I, I decided to have some questions for my presentation. One of them, the main one, of course, is do we need mobile GIS at all and how we should use it and why we are using it at all. Also, we need to think about what type of question, considering mobile GIS, we archaeologists should start to ask, do we know them? And of course, we need to start to think about the data crowd collection. This is a new way of collecting data that mobile GIS allows us. So we need to think if it's a good solution for archaeology. Is it faster? Does it make things cheaper? Are the results greater than comparing to traditional ways of surveying? What problems might occur when mobile GIS and crowd data collection is used in a field survey? 
Last year, during the opening session uh, of Mobile GIS uh, uh, presentation in Atlanta, Nazar and me, we presented you this table where we compared different type of fields, uh, field devices used in the survey with the attributes that are uh, welcomed by archaeologists. And you can see that mobile applications on tablets and smartphones uh, are very uh, good in working with the new and popular things like drones and photogrammetric data. However, they are lacking this, what we discussed earlier uh, in the session, the field durability, battery life, general things that we have when we work in the field in the dust. Also during my presentation last year, I point out what is the main goal of the, uh, of the field survey, and it's of course interpretation for which we have data from archives, and also we have data from the field, which are usually unfortunately distracted sites, and therefore we should think what type of sites we are um, documenting, how we define this, and that the field, we have to remember that the field survey focus on, uh, give us information about the current state of the sites which are distracting. Also, mobile GIS gives us a possibility to document the data on different levels. Also, as you can see on this uh, session uh, today, that we had documentation from this level of the different sites, but we can go even to objects, so really from macro to micro. Of course, the lack of time is always a problem in archaeology, and it was already point out by pioneer of the field survey, Willey, in 1950s, he complained that he didn't have enough time to do uh, accurate sites maps. And last year, the conclusion of my presentation was that the crowd data collection might be a solution for this problem. I decided to do a small experiment concerning this. Uh, in, during our field uh, uh, pure excavation in Castillo de Arme, 300 kilometers away from Lima in Peru on the desertish coast of uh, Peruvian uh, of Peru. <coughs> you can see Castillo is here and I decided to do a field survey uh, on two sites. One site near Castillo which is very well known and documented and another site which I found uh, uh, by my reconnaissance which was never documented before. And uh, we decided uh, to do the field survey with the use of two applications. Both of the sites, I have to notice, both of the sites were very distracted. Uh, I had the help of seven students who came to Castillo de Rame for excavations, and they were so nice that they spent the uh, whole day, because uh, my experiment uh, documentation of those two sites took only one day, half a day for one site, half a day for a second uh, site, and uh, this was enough. We really collected all of possible data. And they gave their own devices. We didn't have um, we didn't have any tablets or smartphones as a project, so they were working on their own devices. And at this point, I would really want to thank them because they were an amazing team and they helped me uh, quite a lot. Uh, devices were mostly iPhones and Samsungs. So how did it look like uh, for collector? First of all, I had to create a close working group. Uh, the collector is the first application I try out, so I needed to create a working group um, inside our university ArcGIS server because we didn't really want it to share our data at this moment. And I needed to create an online map and choose the base map. I wanted to be a satellite image uh, available by ESRI, but later on it turned out that the resolution is not good enough to do anything with that. And I needed to create a classic vectors that we know the shape files. However, they had to have a Z value. And for my line features, I have to admit that's my mistake. I forgot to do the Z values for the line features. And it turned out in the field that student cannot collect the data uh, with the lines because of the mistake I done at the beginning of my process. That's very important to remember. Uh, as for vectors, you can create classic attributes with them, and they have a classic shape file formats. And I decided that for the needs of this experiment, they will be open question. The only, expect, uh, uh, the only um, 
uh, thing that they had to choose was the material what they are documenting. All other uh, attributes uh, were open. I tried to keep them quite simple uh, and easy for them. Of course, we had uh, before we went to the field, we had a small lecture about the mobile GIS and about how to use the applications. So after I created the online map, uh, I needed ex to export it to the mobile application for the group I created earlier. It was based on the uh, online map. And inside uh, the device, when we downloaded uh, the, the, this online map, we had to define the area that we're going to uh, do the research because we decided to do it completely offline uh, without any connection to the internet. So at home, when we were connected to internet, we needed to download the area that we're going to research. And of course, we need to define also the accuracy of measurements. So the, uh, we choose one meter, and that means that the tool or the software didn't allow us to make measurements if the accuracy was greater than that. And that's the result. You have a classic online map with points that we documented. The points contain, of course, the attributes. You can see them as a pop-outs, or you can see them as a attribute tables. And of course, uh, the, you can attach the photos to this application, and then you can watch the photos of the features that were documented. As for survey one to three methodology, Veronica uh, showed you a very nice workflow how to work with this application, uh, but I will focus on a little bit, bit different aspects. So as you saw, survey one to three is a closed questionnaire. So you have very defined questions that you need to answer. And that made me to think about uh, different aspects of the survey I need to have inside this uh, application. So I discovered that I really need to know my site and artifacts that I have on the site because the questionnaire doesn't leave too much open space for students to fill out what they want. But they have to really follow question by question. I also needed to think about the qu questions I'm going to ask and how I'm going to ask them. So of course I needed to set up the basic uh, questions which always have to be like ordinal numbers. I will show you later why. Of course date, our localization and who create this data. Also, how the question is asked is important because you can see here that I created two same questions. They go for two different artifacts, but when I started to work with this data, it turned out they are defined the same, and I don't really know right now to which uh, artifact the answer goes. So it's, it's a hint that you need to really create the questions ahead. Uh, formats for survey one to three, as uh, Veronica showed you, it's a num numeric, date, or descriptive, and you can have them as a different type of questions, single choice, drop down, rating, number, image, or note. And what is very, uh, very nice in survey one to three, and I think that's the, that's the best uh, option in this, uh, in this application is that you can set the rules. So if somebody chooses a specific answer for the question, another question pops out. And it follows and it follows and it follows. So this is how it looked like at the beginning. I spent one day on the site itself to decide what type of artifacts, because I decided it's going to be artifact-oriented uh, survey, what type of artifacts they can find on the site, and what options the, this questions, answer for this question can bring. So it ended up with a lot of sketchy uh, notebook uh, information. And, but this is how it really looked like. So when the students choose that they found a brick, a new question appeared that will it be a single brick or trapeze or anything else? And then new questions followed, is it big or small, etc., etc. And this is how it looked like in application. So you can see that when you choose a different type of answer, another questions appear. And it's very intuitive and it was very easy for students to fill it out uh, by themselves uh, without any help. Again, the result is an online map that you can uh, go through it. You can see the uh, table of attributes. Uh, you can export a single records <coughs> as a uh, report, which includes photos and the location of every artifact, which is very, uh, very good solution to summarize your research also. Additionally, summarization can be shown in a, uh, in a statistic way, in, as a parse or bias. 
However, as I already said in the question times, I had a synchronization problem. As I told you, I had seven students working with me in the field, but for collector, I received only five batches of data. And you can see that there are places missing. And for survey one to three, I received only four batches of data. And please notice the Roberto data. He collected, his, uh, no, he sent seven records of data of his answer. However, his ordinary numbers are three, eight, 17, 65. So in theory, I'm missing around 60 records. And I talked with S3 and we really don't have a solution right now. What happened and where is this data? This is the communication that we got from the phone. I'm sorry it's in Polish because the student phone was uh, in Polish, uh, but it means a mistake of synchronization. And uh, this, is, this is how Roberto data looked like. The gray icons mean that uh, this data was pushed out to the cloud. And uh, we were doing synchronization in the, um, at home, and internet was good quality. <coughs> Students were watching Netflix without a problem, so I don't think that was a problem. And we noticed that iPhones are sending data faster uh, than uh, Samsung's, for example, like they would have a priority. However, it's a technical problem that I cannot go around by myself. Another problem I found, especially for collector and open question, is the quality of collected data. I think it's very easy to spot here that I had different type of data collected. And it's even easier to spot if you go to the map of the, uh, of the site and you choose different attributes, you can see that one person was just collecting points without any description additional. It's easier to check, the, it's harder to check the quality uh, of the data with survey one to three because I need to go through all of the photos and see if the answer chosen in the questionnaire are as, uh, the same as the photo. Uh, to sum that uh, part of the presentation, I really think that we, for the, the crowd data collect, collection, we need a quality control. However, I don't really have an idea an idea how we should control this data at this point. Should we create a control group or we should have a control data? But will this not slow down our process of collecting data? What should be the pros of using mobile GIS in the terrain? Of course, I know what's the problem with my, uh, with my data. Uh, in my group of students, I had one student from bachelor level who, didn't, uh, who wasn't archaeologist. And that's why he was just collecting the points. Other possible problems, as I discussed in the presentation, is, as you notice, the collectors might be overqualified or underqualified. Uh, the other problem might be that uh, while we are preparing the questionnaire, especially with the survey one to three, uh, we might not know the site before, so we might not uh, create the questionnaire as open for, ex for options that we didn't expect. So you really do need to, to your, do your homework and you need to prepare, uh, be prepared for all of the options. Uh, as you saw in previous slides, you can also wrongly define questions and then you will have problems in the post-processing or with working with the data or you can wrongly define vectors, don't add Z value, for example, and then you cannot use them in the field, unfortunately. So to conclude, our mobile GIS application for archeologists. In my opinion, yes, it's amazing uh, application and we can see all other projects in this session today and they gave us a great opportunity to work. However, we need to think about f other stuff like that this is a result, the mobile GIS is a result of the business, of the needs of the market, and it's a product created not for archaeologists. We still can craft our own applications which will be adjusted to our own field surveys. However, we still have to have in the back of our mind that it's a result of the market product. Uh, data synchronization and data loss. I, I think it's a technical issue, uh, but I shouldn't be scared that if I'm gonna collect the data only on my phone, that I'm gonna lose it. 
I think that this uh, that it's going to be solved probably in the future uh, by by developers, but we should be aware of that. Measurement accuracy is something I didn't discuss in this presentation. However, we discuss it in the session. We know it might be a problem. I also think that uh, it's going to be a technical issue which we'll solve in the future. As right now, we already have a GPS, outside GPS, that the phones can connect and make the higher uh, accuracy for the measurements. As for the uh, especially survey one to three questionnaires and creation of the questions or attributes that we collect in the field, it really did resemble me creation of the Polish database of the um, archaeological sites, which is already questioned in Poland because it really narrows down our option and doesn't leave uh, space for uh, interpretation or the thoughts. So I really think that we need to look at this, if it's a step forward using mobile GIS to collect data, or maybe we are using uh, new technologies uh, with the old way of thinking. And the crowd data collection, what I mentioned already, we need to be aware that when we have many people collecting data for us, that their quality might be not uneven and therefore might not be usable uh, in the analysis in the future. So, to sum up, is mobile GIS in archaeology making things faster, cheaper, or gr greater? I think right now, not really, but we are heading towards this idea. Thank you very much.